please welcome Donna. All right, well, welcome everybody tonight. So I think I have, I have to try not to trip on this. And, and use the clicker, so hopefully we'll get through this successfully. So um, as Cynthia was saying, I have you know, been working with startups for now 29 years, so I've seen lots and lots of different startups through, through those years. I work with companies across a very broad range of industries, so started out years ago working with, with disk drive companies and storage companies. I work with companies in enterprise software, you know, internet, mobile, I work with clean tech companies, biotech companies, and um, you know, and everything in between. So, and what what I do with these companies is everything from you know working with you know founders and entrepreneurs like you, who are just thinking about an idea and trying to get it started and off the ground, and then hopefully um, growing, helping those companies grow through their various stages, doing you know venture financings and taking companies public or selling them in a liquidity transaction. So before I get started, I'd, I'd like to just get a show of hands from, from you all. You know, how many of you are currently working on a startup? Oh, virtually everybody, great. How many of you have been in successful startups before? A lot of you. Um, how many of you felt like you did all the right things in your, in your startup before nobody right yeah it's hard to do and nobody does it and that's not it's not important to do everything right it's, it's I think the um, you know one of the mottos here is to get it out and not make it perfect but there are certain things in, from the legal perspective that it's really important to get right and if you do them right in the beginning it's going to save you a lot of headaches and a lot of cost and expense on the back end so what I'm going to talk about today is basically how not to get tripped up on legal matters so that you can focus on just on building your company, which is what you all really want to do. Okay, so, so why are legal issues, why do they matter when you're setting up your business? Do you want, we, we want to make sure that you keep the house in order. Um, this is going to create and protect value for you and your business. And in terms of, you know, when you're, if you're looking for other people's money to help you fund and start the business, keeping the house in order is going to make it easier for you to raise that money to get through that financing. It's going to help you manage the risk, and it's going to make your investors happier. So, what, so we're going to try to quickly go through the top 10 tips. I'm happy to take questions through, throughout if you'd like, and then of course at the end, um, I'll leave some time for questions, but feel free to you know, raise your hand. And I, I got some questions earlier, and I think I'll hit most of those during the presentation, but if I don't, you know, feel free to let me know you have a question. So what's the first tip? So the first tip is set the, a good foundation. So when you're gonna start your business, we wanna make sure that you have everything in order in terms of leaving a current employer. So of all of you who are starting your companies right now, how many of you are working full time on your company? Some of you. And how many of you are currently employed elsewhere? Right. So if you are currently employed elsewhere, then it's really important that you carefully divide what you're doing to start your new company from what you're doing at your employer because what you don't want to have happen is you don't want your employer to own what you're going to what you're doing in terms of taking starting your new company so you shouldn't be working at your current employer on their time on their computers on your project because if you do that your employer could own it instead of you owning it and then you're going to get into a situation where you may have to license it back or they may not want to give it to you or you might get into some dispute with them and you don't want to have to deal with that. If you've already started, you, you've left your employer and you're, and you're starting your company and you're, you're doing it with a buddy or you're some friends or some co-founders and if they're working for somebody else, you have the same concern about what they're doing and you want to make sure that they're working on your project only on their own time outside of their employer on their own equipment. 
So, so it's really important to have that set up right. You want to make sure that, you know, to the extent I presume most of you are doing technology companies that have, you know, some intellectual property. I'll come back to the second. The, um, so you want to make sure you own the intellectual property that is going to be the basis for your company. So if you have um, if, you, if you start your company, you want to have agreements in place that say that if you have consultants who are working for you, that they are going to trans, that you own the work that they're doing for you. It's a work for hire. That needs to be in an agreement that's written down that says that you own that um, intellectual property. And it's really important that you own it, right? Because otherwise you can't build your company around that, sell it, or license it. If um, you, you're going to want to understand if people that you hire, whether they have any restrictions on um, joining your company, did they sign a non-compete when they left their last company? And um, in California, we're fortunate that non-competes generally are not enforceable. But if you have, if you are co-founding a company or you yourself sold a company successfully. Um, you, you may have entered into a non-compete or your co-founder may have entered into a non-compete that is enforceable. It says they're, they're enforceable in California if they're entered into in connection with the sale of a business and, they, and you own a substantial part of that business. So you want to understand whether or not there's any restrictions on the people that you're hiring to work with you or that you're you know, co-founding a company with and whether or not they can actually do that work without um, causing any issues. Like, say, likewise, if you're, as you're building your team, non-solicits, which, which say that you won't go and hire people from, from your last employer, those are enforceable also in California. So if you want to, if you're trying to hire a bunch of people from your old employer and maybe you're doing something that's competitive to them, they may not like that and they'll send you legal letters saying stop it or we're going to sue you. And, and you don't want to spend time or money on that, so you just want to be really careful about um, those types of issues. You have a question over here? So the question is if you have, how do you control basically the people that you hire who you may not know as well as your co-founders who you trust, et cetera. So the answer is you have an agreement that, that says that they will not, um, that they're not bringing any third party intellectual property in, that they're only working on your, on your project and that you, um, that they have the authority to do what they're doing. So, and that's covered, we, there are standard agreements and standard language for that, that you can, um, that you can make sure that they sign. Yes. So the question is, how important is it that you're doing something that's not in the same space as your company? And the answer is that it's, it, it depends. <laughs> so it depends on whether uh, what you're doing at your current employer is something that's protectable. Is it a trade secret? You, you basically, you can't take trade secrets or any, any, any intellectual property from your current employer. And so the closer it is to what you're doing, then the more likely you are to have a potential issue. And if you want clarity on that, whether or not you can go forward and do your idea, then you, would, you, might, you could ask your employer whether they want to pursue this idea and ask for a waiver. But unfortunately, most employers won't, won't sign those things because they don't know what they might want to do in the future. So if it's something that's very closely related to what your employer is doing, um, you need to, you're going to need to make a judgment call and, it, and you should probably leave the employer before you actually um, pursue it. And definitely don't take anything with you. Don't take any software or anything on your computer or anything that could be um, deemed to be, you know, taking or stealing trade secrets or intellectual property, which is a crime. <laughs> 
Okay, so, so the second tip would be you, you want to limit your liability when you're setting up a company. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I've got a lot to go through and I think we want to get through by around eight-ish, right? So, um, so, so to, to limit your liability, you set up a corporate entity or, uh, or a limited liability company. Most of our startups, you know, if you're raising money from venture capitalists or other angel investors, you're going to be setting up as a corporation. So, and the reason for that is that it, it protects your personal assets. So you, if, you're, if you're a corporate entity, then you're not liable personally for what the corporation does. So it's a way to protect, you know, your house and your family assets and, um, and not get in trouble with your spouse, basically. So, so you put whatever assets you want into that company, you can fund it to the amount that you want, but then it's, you know, whatever liabilities that company incurs stay with, that, with the company as opposed to you personally. So the other reasons to set up a corporation, yes? Yes. So, so the question is, why do we lawyers generally recommend that you set up as a Delaware corporation when we're here in California? And the reason is because there's a couple reasons. One of them is that Delaware is much more business friendly in terms of doing deals. So California Secretary of State closes at 5 o'clock and you can't get anything done past 5 o'clock. Um, we can file documents and get deals done past 7 p.m. California time in Delaware or very early in the morning. So when we, and we know when we do um, a financing or a merger transaction that when we make a filing, it's accepted in Delaware and the deal is done. In California, you make a filing and you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait. For many, it can be several days. And they can and they do a merit review and they might come back with comments on your doc on your on your deal and say, well, we want you to change this or that. And that creates uncertainty. When you're doing transactions, you want to have certainty. So that so you do end up, if you're located in California and you incorporate in Delaware, you have to pay California franchise taxes, but it's a small price to pay to be to have certainty that you can get your deals done on the time frame that you want to get your deals done. So you pay a thousand dollars a little under a thousand dollars to be a corporation in California that um, and then you pay Delaware taxes as well but we're talking about doing any kind of venture financing doing any kind of merger and acquisition transaction and um, it, it California unfortunately creates a lot of uncertainty in terms of getting those transactions done yes Yes, yeah, so the question is the differences in personal liability between different types of business entities. So if a sole proprietorship, if you're not incorporated, it's you're, you're personally liable. So the ones that protect you, the, there's two basic entities that you can use to protect you to limit your liability. One's a limited liability corporation, an LLC and one is a corporation itself. And the reason we don't do a lot of LLCs for startups is because um, invest, institutional investors won't invest in an LLC. But, it, it, but an LLC can be an option, depends on what your business is. It's the same, you get the same legal protection from a limited liability point of view, but it's much more expensive to set it up and to maintain it because you have an operating agreement that's, um, that's 
customized for each particular thing and it, you, you can't, you know, one of the advantages I was going to say here about a corporation is that there's equity compensation norms, there's, there's stock ownership, it's very easy to issue the stock. In an LLC, you're, you're constantly having to update and amend your operating agreement. So from a legal perspective, it's more expensive administratively to set up and to maintain it. Um, there can be tax advantages and reasons to do it, so you really just have to talk to an attorney to figure out whether it's the right thing to do for your company. Um, in terms of you know the corp the corporate advantages include the fact that you know it's it's very familiar to investors. They understand the stock interests. They understand you know it's the shares are transferable with some restrictions for security law interests, and it's generally um, pretty easy to administer with simple documentation. So on um, so I'm not going to go into the tax stuff because we don't have a lot of time. So with the other, tip number three would be keep it simple. Really, you know, you're all very creative people. That's why you're entrepreneurs. And, um, but use your creativity in creating your product and, and your business or your service that you're going to um, sell to the marketplace. The capitalization, you want to keep as simple as possible. I mean, you do obviously know of examples of, of companies like Google that have two class of you know, common stock, but that's generally not the norm, and there's very few um, cases where you can get away with that and when you're going out for investment money. So, the, so the, if you can just keep it straightforward and simple, it's going to make it a lot easier in general to maintain it you know, in terms of keeping, um, sticking with norms. So if you... On our, on, our, on our Wilson, Sonsini, Goodrich, and Rosati website, wsgr.com, that we have a, uh, a set of, entre a, a tab for entrepreneurial services, and you can go on there and, and you know, search for term sheet and how to do a term sheet or how to do a bridge term, bridge note term sheet, and it'll walk you through sort of a tutorial and you can create a, a um, term sheet. And you want to stick with the norms and you want to understand them, and I'll explain that a little bit more. But don't try to put, make it too fancy, at least in the early stages. Until 8.30, okay. Yes. So yeah, so the question is what about preferred shares? So, so yes, yeah, so the typical um, company, when you raise money, and, and you bring in outsiders is to have preferred stock. So for, comp, for the founders, so this is a typical uh, type of a structure if you have you know, three founders, that you do the common stock for the founding team, and then the people who are investing just fi as financial investors, venture capitalists, angel investors, et cetera, then they would, they would get preferred stock. So do you have a question about that? Yeah. Why don't the founders get preferred shares? Um, they can. There's no rule that says that they can't get preferred shares. But the issue is that typically founders are um, they're investing their time, their energy, their creativity to to the company. And you want typically when a company is when you're first launching the company and starting it out. You want to keep the share price for the founders and for the founding team and those that you're trying to um, recruit to work with you on the business at a very low price. And so typically a founder stock, in, you know, in this example, we're suggesting that it, you issue 2 million shares to each of three founders at 0.001 cents a share. And the reason for that is at the very earliest stages, it's not clear what value there is in the company. You've got a great idea, but there's a lot of risk. You have to execute on it. And so you, you issue that shares at a very low price with the hope that the company is going to be successful, that you're going to move it forward, and that that stock's going to be worth a lot later on. So you get the benefit of, you know, if the, if the company grows, that, you know, you know, the stock that was 0.001 cents a share in the beginning maybe is $10 when the company goes public. The preferred stock is issued to the investors because they're coming in and they're making a financial investment and they're willing to pay a higher price for that and to get preferences. So when they, when they buy into the company, they typically get 
Series A stock, and then it's, it's, it's alphabetically numbered, Series A, B, C, for each successive round of financing. And they pay a higher price because they get but these preferences and privileges, which means that if the company does a, um, a sale event, which is called a liquidity event in, in, the, in the terminology of investors, then they get their money back first. They may have, they have a right if the company pays out any dividends to get their dividends first. They, have, um, they may have control rights to control the board of directors and to, get, to have to approve certain types of transactions. They may have supermajority rights. So, they, so in exchange for those rights, they, get, they pay more. For, so they may pay a dollar a share for, their, for, the, for the Series A preferred or 50 cents or something you know, higher than the common stock. Founders, in some cases, who are actually investing, who have cash to invest into the company, may participate in the preferred stock funding, and, and they could be um, preferred stockholders too. But if they're not putting actual dollars into the company for capital, it's usually just common stock because it's just simpler. And, it, and, it, and then you get the value of the increase in the equity. So in this case, we just have you know, an example of just three founders sharing equally. Yes. So the question is, what about founders who, who basically pay themselves in preferred stock for their salary? That's not typical to do because typically the founders, because you, because in this example, it's very typical that founders aren't paying themselves cash, right? Because they don't have cash you know, to pay themselves. So, so, it's, so typically they earn the stock to, by vesting in the stock. And so stock for, um, for in a startup for the employees, including the founders, is usually considered part of their compensation. And it's usually earned over time. So uh, if you have, how many of you have stock options or have had stock options in companies before? So you're all familiar with the vesting concept, right? Where you have to stay with the company for a period of time before you have the right to, to own those shares or to purchase those shares if it's an option. Um, so, I mean, you certainly could have examples where if you worked a long time for a company without getting paid that you um, would get stock for that, but it's not typical to have it be preferred stock. And that would be an issue that would get negotiated with the investors if you sell preferred stock to outside investors. Yes. So the question is, what's the difference between issuing stock options versus stock? So an option is an option that you're, you're, you're given a right today to buy stock at today's price, it, and you can buy it, you can exercise that right to buy it in the future. So you don't make an investment decision until later. So you can, if you, today the stock is a penny a share because, the, you know, it's the very earliest stages of your company, you can get an option to buy, you know, 100,000 shares at a penny today, and you can wait to see if the company is successful to, you know, to exercise that option. If you issue stock up front, then you're then you have to buy that at that time. So it's typical for founders to to own their shares and to buy those those initial shares, and that ownership of those shares. You know the shares have to be paid for, and the question is how do those get paid for? So if it's you know if it's a really low price, you would transfer. There's many different ways it can get paid for. It can get paid for by transferring in intellectual property. <laughs> Because many, many companies or many founders start working on your idea before you incorporate the company or actually set up the entity. So anything that's done pre-incorporation is owned by the individual, not by the company. And you want to make sure that the company owns it so that the company can hold, you know, run its business. So in, in connection with setting up the stock, you would transfer the intellectual property in in exchange for the stock. You can write a check for the, you know, if, if that's what you prefer to do, transfer in the business ideas. So those are different ways to pay for the stock. In the very earliest stages of the company, when the stock price is really, really low, 
um, generally companies do just issue the stock and the, because the employees or the advisors can afford to buy it at that price. Um, and it's also avoids having to do something that we call a 409A valuation, which is required for issuing stock options to avoid some onerous tax consequences under federal and state law. So in the earliest stages, you know, just issuing stock works and you can still have it subject to vesting, which means the company can buy back the unvested shares when, if an employee leaves before their shares get vested. There's a question in the back there. How did, I didn't hear that. And How does it change if you have a founder who's not, I didn't. Oh, who's an immigrant? Who's, a, who's, a non, who's not a US citizen or resident? It doesn't necessarily. So if the founder, if, if the, I mean, we have a lot of companies that are started by people from, you know, around the world, but the, it, it, whether the, if, the, if the person's located here, you can issue the stock. If they're not located here, then you would have to understand what the laws of, the, of their country are, where they're located, whether or not you can issue stock or options and, um, to, in that particular country. Okay. So, yes? I said you have to, it depends on your company and that's a complicated question that has to be addressed on a customized basis. Right, but as I said, it's, it's much more expensive to set up, to do the, corp, the documents for forming an LLC and an operating agreement are very, they're customized um, in a ways that corporate documents are not customized, so it can just be more expensive. But you can certainly be the right answer for certain companies or an S corporation as well. It's going to depend on your investors in the particular situation. Yes? Uh, how many authorized shares versus how many shares are issued? And what percent of the shares should be gone for, uh, for stock options? Yeah, so what yeah, so the question is when you go out and you get venture capital money, sort of what are the, what are the percentages that you would set aside for an option pool and, um, and authorized and issued shares? So, so when, you, when you bring in the money from the, the venture capitalists, the, that's a negotiation, right? So, so there's no hard and fast rule for that. No, you would never have, you would probably not want to reserve more than 20% in your option pool. We're seeing those percentages come down in the early stages because um, because when whatever you reserve in that plan gets counted against you basically as as if they were outstanding so it's so it's it's a derived number depending on what how many people are in your startup to begin with how much money you're raising how many people you need to hire um, in the time between when you raise that money and when you expect to raise the next round. So, so it's something that you would work through with your um, investor and try to come up with a number that's reasonable and not overstated. So if you, in, the, in this example, if these three founders are all you need to get through the next year, then you wouldn't have a very big option pool. I mean, you would need other people probably that you would be hiring as, a, as advisors, so you would have maybe a 10% pool. But if you needed to hire a big team to get your deal done and you needed to hire some people who are gonna get big option stakes, then your pool might be 15%. So it's, it's, there's no set answer to that. I guess what we're asking is what, what is the number of shares? Because yeah. the first time I was at that company, mm -hmm. 
Yep. Yeah, it doesn't matter is the answer. So the question is, how, what's your authorized shares? So you authorize enough shares that are going to get you through your first stages. So if you're, if you're not anticipating going out and raising money right away, you're bootstrapping, you're going to bring in some advisors, you want to have enough shares authorized so that you can issue options and grant stock without having to go back and amend your certificate of incorporation to authorize more shares because you're going to be in control. So in this situation, the founders control this and you can decide if you want to authorize more shares, but it requires making an amendment to a certificate of incorporation, which requires a filing, which requires a filing fee and also requires sometimes attorney's fees. And, you don't, and so you want to authorize enough shares that you don't have to bother doing that. That would be our advice. And so if, so if you came to us, we would say authorize 10 million shares, you know, have a few, th few million shares extra to get you through to that first round of financing. And when you get, bring in a venture capitalist, then you're going to change everything and you're going to have to make amendments. Yes? This is true. So the question is, what about paying founders and founders who don't have money typically don't pay themselves, but under, under California, you know, labor law, you are required to pay your employees at least minimum wage. And yes, that is the law. And that's what we would advise you to do. And what's the risk if you don't do it? The risk is that you have liability to those employees who you did not pay to pay them at least minimum wage and they can bring in action. So, so that's a calculated risk that you have to decide whether to take it or not. And, um, it, it, but the law requires you to pay at least minimum wage. Right, minimum wage. Yes. I'm sorry. It's it's employees. So anybody who's an employee in the company has to be paid. Is you know supposed to be paid at least minimum wage. Well, founders are if they're employee. If you if you set it up so that you're an employee, then what's I'm sorry. Any, anybody who's, who's providing services for the company is a, an employee or a consultant. And so anyone, so even founders, so if you have, so the potential visa for founders who are working together on a startup is if, if you have more than one founder and you're not paying yourselves and if a founder gets unhappy or there's a dispute or they leave, they could have an action for minimum for minimum wage for the period of time that they worked. Yes. Uh, as a follow up on that, uh, I know of a number of startups that are uh, have have everybody listed as contractors or consultants. Right. <laughs> Yeah. So that. So the question. So. So there is an issue regarding um, classifying people as employees versus consultants or advisors, and um, I'm not going to get into that. But that's another potential liability issue: is if you misclassify people as consultants and you don't withhold the appropriate taxes, there's potential liability for the company for that. But the reality is that these are generally pretty small risks um, in the very earliest stages of a startup when you're when you're just getting started before you get funded. Can the options be created, you said? The um, stock option rule can, pool can be created, yeah, before the first round of funding. You can do it in the early, before you get funding. Right. So, so, yes, whenever any stock that's issued at any time is going to dilute the existing stockholders. So. So, but if you need those shares to attract your team, then you create your option pool. Most companies do create their option pools before they bring in outside money. 
Yes. Yeah, well, the, from companies have to come have to show on their um, financial statements the the um, compensation expense of, of stock options, even though it's a non cash charge. So that's everyone's been doing that now for years, and the market understands that and accepts it. But it's just it's just an accounting issue, basically. So, so we, it, tip number four is, is to get it in writing. You know, we talked, I've talked a little bit about this already, but you want to make sure that you have an understanding among the founders, you know, as to what the roles are and, and what their ownership positions are going to be. So if there are any disputes, you've got that in writing. Um, you need to decide among your founders, are you going to put vesting restrictions in place? And why would you put vesting restrictions in place if it's just you, just, you know, you, you two or three people together? What's the benefit of that? If anybody leaves, right? So if you have a co-founder who isn't pulling their weight and or needs to leave for personal reasons or they're just not the right fit, you want to get those, you don't want them to walk away with a third of the shares and they're not doing any work on the company, right? So you want to be able to get those shares back that they didn't invest in. So that's the reason for, for getting um, that in writing. And also will memorialize the transfer of the intellectual property into the company so that they can't walk away with that, with that intellectual property. Um, so it's really important you know, and helpful to have that in writing as well. Yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> you so the question is, can you set up different vesting for the for different co-founders? Yes, you can. Um, and then it's going to be a question of whether or not you know everybody's comfortable with that. So you're going to have to work it out so that you have a team that's wanting to work together and if, if you know, and to not have friction. And so if you, but certainly it can make sense where if you've been working on the idea for a year and then you go out and you find your team to say you get a year's worth of credit of vesting up front and then everybody else is going to start their vesting from the time they, they join the team. And that's perfectly fine and fair, and p people get comfortable with that. Yes. So how do you protect against diluting your shares? It's hard. It's not, it's not necessarily. So if you, if you are a minority or you're a smaller founder or co-founder in a company and if you're if you the company's going to go out and raise money and um, and people are going to play different roles it's going to be hard to protect your um, your interest without it getting diluted you could have an agreement that says that you don't won't get diluted or that you're protected to a certain point of time or to a certain you know when until the company raises a certain amount of money um, but the really the best way to protect yourself is to you know do a stellar job so that they're going to want to keep you and so what typically happens in you know, venture financings, et cetera, is everyone gets diluted. You know, as, as money comes into the company, you know, this pie is going to get divided up and everyone's going to get diluted. But with the, but the venture capitalists, if they want this to be a successful company, they want the team to stay motivated and they typically will annually review the ownership positions of the founders and the executive team, you know, the key employees. And if they feel like they're not appropriate, if they don't own enough, if they feel like you don't own enough, or if you've gotten diluted too much, then they top, they do, you know, top up grants. In the back there. How many different classes of... Sh 
How, so how about having different classes of shares? I think I answered this in the beginning. It's our, you, do, you will have different classes of shares between investors versus usually the, the founders and the employees usually have common, the investors usually have preferred. We don't generally, um, we recommend having multiple classes or subclasses of common stock and um, for, for founders, um, although we, we do see that or do that from time to time. And it's, it's just gonna depend on who those founders are, what their track record is, and whether or not they're gonna be able to attract capital with that kind of structure. So it's, a lot's gonna depend on whether you're raising money outside. Yes, here in the front. Yeah, Yeah, so a, a preemptive right is a right to buy shares in each, you know, in subsequent rounds of financing. And yes, those are recognized, um, and they're typical. They're typical to um, be in preferred stock financing documents. So the investors typically have preemptive rights to maintain an interest, their ownership interest in subsequent financings. And so if, if, the, you, know, if you have venture capitalists who own 20% of the company in the first round, they have the right to maintain that 20% in the next round. And they typically will waive it if they want to bring in another investor into the company. The, um, the founders usually don't have that right. Although if they have enough, if they have capital to invest, then they can get that right. In the back, yes. Yeah, so the, so the question is on the founders who get their stock for transferring in the intellectual property or paying a very low amount of money, is there vesting? And, and the answer was, we rec there doesn't have to be. We recommend that there be, if, especially if there's more than one founder for the reasons we said before, which is so that, if, so that everybody's motivated to stay with the company and that if they leave, then you're, you can buy those shares back. So, you know, we talked about, you know, making sure that you, you stay clear about the roles, and I want to show a picture here. So this is, a, you know, the typical corporate structure. So you have on the top your investors, um, your, share, uh, who, your shareholders who can be investors, they can be employees of the company, and the shareholders elect the board of directors. And the investors who put in the, the big money typically will try to have control of the board. But in, a, in early stages of startups, you might see a board structure where the investors elect two board members, the founders elect two board members, and maybe there's one independent. So, so they don't necessarily take control in the very earliest stages. But that's, a, that's usually heavily negotiated as part of the, the investment terms. And, and then optionees are, you know, all of your employees that you're going to try to motivate um, and by giving them the option to buy stock in the company um, and become owners in that company. And then, so the board is responsible for selecting, you know, hiring and firing the CEO and the management of the company. Uh, the CEO, you know, typically in a very early stage startup will be one of the founders, but then as the company, you know, grows, maybe the, maybe the founder becomes the chief technical officer or takes some other role and, and, uh, and you, the, um, a new CEO may be hired. So that's a typical um, structure that may happen or you, or you can have something like, you know, with Google where, you know, Eric Schmidt was brought in and they worked with Larry Page and Sergey and then, and then, you know, Larry Page takes over again after you know several years so so those are sort of typical structures yes so in the typical um, startup the board always hires and fires the CEO 
And then, and then it really depends on the company and the personalities and the experience of the CEO, whether the board gets involved at hiring the CEO's staff, which is the, you know, the direct reports, the, the vice presidents, the chief operating officer, the chief technical officer. So in some boards, they're very involved in that. In others, they're going to let the CEO um, make those decisions, although I, in most cases, I would think the CEO would consult with the board. In those high, in those major hires. Are there different ways of structuring voting rights for board members? Typical, typical board Delaware is one one vote for each board member. You can structure. Uh, under Delaware law, but none of my companies have ever done this in 29 years. You can structure multiple votes for a board member, but it's not typical, and it would cause all kinds of questions and issues when you're going out to fundraise. But you can, it's something that is allowed under Delaware law. So um, in another issue when you're, you know, not to get tripped up on is making sure that you just mind the basics. And as I was saying earlier on in this, um, when we were getting started, is that there's certain things that are pretty easy to do right. And, um, but if, and if you do them wrong, they can be incredibly expensive to fix. So you want to make sure that you, when you issue stock in your company, that you've authorized enough shares that the shares actually exist before you issue them because you can't issue shares that aren't authorized under your certificate of incorporation that's filed in Delaware or California or wherever your, your company is incorporated. So you have to, and then the authority to issue stock is vested in the board of directors and Delaware is pretty sticky about this. It has to be the board that has to authorize those shares. So, so I had a situation where we took over a company that was came to us, the venture capitalists brought it to us in a series B or C round, and the, um, and the company had been formed as a Delaware corporation using Israeli lawyers to form it, and they never actually established the board correctly. So they never um, set the first board members, and therefore every single stock issuance that had been done before we discovered this was not authorized. And so in order to fix that, it was a big mess that we had to go back and basically create a whole new corporation and merge it into the other corporation. And it was a very expensive process to fix. So it's just these things that are, you know, see, seem pretty basic, but you want to make sure when you, when you set up your company that you, from day one, that your incorporator appoints a board and that board is the ones, only ones that can issue stock, and that before they, the stock is authorized, is granted, you've actually authorized enough shares to um, issue those shares of stock. Um, there's differences. Some, some companies, a lot of startups use advisors. A lot of companies use boards of advisors. They, these can be very helpful to you. In, um, in consulting with them to brainstorm on your product ideas, to get, you know, to get extra help. As we see it a lot in life science companies, but it can be in any kind of industry. A board of advisors does not have fiduciary duties. They're just, they're just like consultants, and you can, um, you can compensate them with, with um, small amounts of stock options. They can have vesting, but they don't have any fiduciary duties to the corporation or the stockholders. The board of directors has fiduciary duties to the stockholders. They're the governing body, and they have, um, they have liabilities and, and fiduciary duties, so they're different types of boards, and you need to keep them, understand the differences between a board of directors and a board of advisors. Um, consultants versus employees, we alluded to that. It's just understanding that um, there can be issues around labor laws. If you, if you misclassify somebody who should be an employee as a consultant and you don't pay the proper taxes, it can create liabilities for your company. The other thing to keep in mind with consultants is that you absolutely should have a written agreement with your consultant because if they do work for you and you don't have a written agreement that says it belongs to your company, they own it. Okay, so you have to get that in writing under California law, works for hire, belong to the person who did the work um, unless you have that in writing. 
for your employees, you want them to sign um, invent, you know, proprietary information, um, confidentiality, invention assignment agreements that's, that are, make it clear that what all the work that they do while they're working for you, they should keep confidential and that they assign over any of their inventions. So tip number seven is to understand the vocabulary. If you're gonna go out and raise financing, um, then you wanna understand when you're negotiating what, what do these terms mean? And you know, in a typical um, term sheet for a venture financing, you're gonna have preferred stock, common stock, we're gonna, it's gonna talk about vesting, it's gonna talk about liquidity event. What's a liquidity event? A liquidity event is usually a sale of the company or an IPO. It's the, uh, it's the way that the investors get their money back for their investment. And you're going to want to understand what, when a venture capitalist talks about valuation, they're going to they're going to throw around terms like pre-money and post-money, and um, and what does that all mean? And there's a lot of um, of terminology that um, that will come up. We've talked about this a lot of this stuff already about the um, you know the the way the the stock. Is, um, is a representation of your ownership in the company, and you'll have this dual class structure of the preferred for the investors, the common for the employees. And you want to understand, as I was being asked before, the difference between authorized stock and what's outstanding and what's reserved. And so, and these all play a big role in your discussions about valuation because when you're, when the stock is a proxy for the ownership in the company, and you'll and you'll talk about valuation in a company if it's a you know if it's a ten million dollar valuation and you have ten million shares outstanding, it's a you know it's a dollar a share, and um, but you might have of the of the ten million shares, maybe um, two million are reserved in your employee pool and you haven't actually issued them yet, but they actually count as if they were outstanding when you're going out and you're talking to the venture capitalists and it counts against your fully diluted capitalization and your negotiations with um, the venture capitalists. So, you know, we've talked about, you know, the fact that, so you've got the two class structure, you've got the, um, the common stock is used as compensation, um, typically, and the investors get the, pay the higher price, have senior rights, get their money back, maybe 2x their money back, or some, some um, you know, other variable of, of a preference when the company, if the company is sold. The other, when preferred stock usually has the right to convert into common stock at any at the option of the holder, and so um, a typical structure would be that the preferred stock, if the company is going to get sold, they'll make a decision whether they would get more money by converting into common or staying as preferred and getting a preference. And so, so those are things you you'd want to work through with your attorney to understand. Um, you know, this sort of is a, a demonstration of how the, the, the preferred stock prices will typically be much higher than the common stock prices with a bigger differential in the earlier stages of the company and the, and the two prices converging together closer as the company gets to be later stage and, and potentially a candidate for an IPO. So at the time, you know, so by the time you get to a mezzanine round or close to an IPO, you're going to see those two prices converge. And in an IPO scenario, the preferred stock will convert to common, and, and the, stock, the stock structure typically is one class of stock, of common stock going out, because the, the underwriters don't like to sell um, shares where there's more than, where there's anybody who would have a preference. Yes. 
Yeah, so the question is, can, yes, can you, do, can you issue common stock at a, at a lower price or, than a preferred stock price? Yes, and they, but typically you don't use common to, in this, to raise money. So common is usually just used to compensate your employees and it's, and it's the founder stock. If you're raising money, it's typically done as a preferred stock. And, and one of the reasons you don't use common is because it would be incredibly dilutive at the lower prices to issue a bunch of common. And it also, you're, one of the preferences that preferred stock always has is something called anti-dilution protection. It's price-based anti-dilution protection, which says that if you issue shares at a lower price than they paid for it, they get, to, they get a higher conversion ratio. So instead of converting one share of preferred to one share of common, they might convert one share of preferred to you know two shares of common. So so and then there's different exceptions to those anti-dilution provisions that allow you to grant low priced options to your employees, but not to sell low priced common to investors. So we talked about vesting. You know, typical vesting in the Silicon Valley is a four-year vesting period. We typically see something called, we call it a one-year cliff, where nothing vests for the first year of employment, and then thereafter it'll vest, you know, a quarter of it will vest at the end of one year, and then it'll vest monthly over, um, you know, the remaining three years. So that's a very typical vesting period. And talked about this. So, in terms of you know other vocabulary to understand is you know valuation. So it's basically um, you know, there's many different ways to say the same thing. So you can you know you might hear a, a VC say you know we're willing to put two million in at a three million dollar pre money valuation or we need to have 40% of the company if we're gonna invest two million. Well, it's the same thing, basically. So the pre-money valuation is, you know, what's the company worth with the shares that are outstanding before they put their money in? And if they're, if they, um, you know, in, in this example, if they're putting two million in on a three money, three million dollar money valuation, then then post money valuation is five million. You add the pre money to the whatever the investment amount to get your post money valuation. And for different at different time periods, different types of industries, those valuations, what's the norm, will vary, um, and it you know depends on what's hot today. Uh, we're typically seeing probably the early, you know, Series A type rounds or can be five to eight million dollar pre-money valuations. We on our website publish data on this quarterly. So you can look at what the trends are in valuation. You can look at what the trends are in terms of the types of preferences, et cetera, um, that are offered in these financings. Um, we would, you know, tip number eight is focus on what matters. There's just, you know, as I've been doing this for 29 years, there, the, the types of terms that are in these agreements are, are pretty standard. And there's a lot of things you don't really need to negotiate because they're, they're, um, they're very standard language. So you want to ask your attorney, you know, what are the things that you should really focus on? Um, because you'd, otherwise it can get really expensive if you're trying to negotiate things that nobody's going to budge about. So, so the things that you, um, that we, you know, typically might say that are important, of course, is that's going to be unique to you are what's, you know, what's the valuation? Are you comfortable with that? Um, you know, how much money do you need in this, in this transaction? Some of the, some of the liquidation preferences, um, you know, the, the board, you know, who's on the board, um, yeah, board representation and control type issues. But if you have an experienced attorney to help you, they should be able to tell you what's, what are the market norms. And you can look at, you know, things like on our website that will show you what's, what the market trends are. And then you're going to want to understand ultimately what's, what's, what's your goal? What's your end game? Are you looking for, um, if you bring in other people's money, then they're going to want to have a liquidity event. And that's either going to be an IPO 
or it's going to be a sale of the company. And um, whether or not you, you know you have a company that can become an IPO candidate is going to depend on market conditions and and how how big of a market there are and some things that are outside your control. But you want to try to understand the end game because that's going to help you as you build your company and focusing on different provisions in your agreements, change of control provisions and contracts, et cetera. So when you have a contract and it, it says if you know this this contract is terminable if you have a change of control and you're planning on, you know, selling your company in a merger, then that and that's your key customer, that's gonna be a showstopper if that client, if that customer can go away when you sell the company. And we see these issues come up over and over again in mergers. So you so you want to try to keep your end game in mind when you're when you're negotiating some of your business agreements. And then you know you're gonna want to, you know, last tip is you know, manage your risk to maximize your growth. So, um, you know, a, a reminder that when you're issuing stock, you have to be in compliance with securities laws. So, um, you know, if you issue uh, stock and it's not in compliance with securities laws, then you can, your um, investors can get their money back. And that, you know, that, that could be a big problem for you, right? And um, you can have other, all kinds of other issues. Um, and then you want to, you know, think about, you know, your business risks versus your legal risks. Let, let your lawyer tell you, um, you know, if there's any, you know, gotchas in terms of the legal risks, and then you can assess what the business risks are um, with, your, with your model. So, you know, in summary, you know, these are sort of the top 10 things that we would, we would suggest you focus on so that you can hopefully uh, start your company and um, maximize your growth. So... I think we have time for, yeah. Time for a couple, a couple more questions, yes. Did you make the slides available to us in some fashion? Yeah. We'll, we'll post them. Yes, and yeah, happy to make the slides available. Yes, yes over here. Yeah. So it if, if you have founders and they're totally vested, and then you go out and you raise outside capital, chances are that the if if the um, the investors are investing in the founding team, so they're going to want to have vesting. They're going to ask for revesting of some sort because they're going to want those golden handcuffs on that team. Yes, I think you had a question. So, so it, it's a risk assessment. So the question is if you've got somebody who's doing work now and, and with the expectation that they'll um, you know, get some, grow some skills or gain some additional skills and get a percentage later and get paid later. Um, the law requires you to pay at least minimum wage. And if you don't, which I, again, most startups do not in the very early stages when they don't have any money, then you're just taking the risk that she can make a complaint if, if she's an unhappy employee and wants to complain that she didn't get paid later. So it's a risk, it's a risk assessment. It's just a risk. I, the, I, all I can tell you is that, that you know, the law requires you to pay minimum wage and that if you don't pay minimum wage, you're just taking a risk by not doing that. <laughs> 
No, that doesn't, that's not, I mean, you would have to, you, have, you can pay, you'd have to pay her the minimum wage and then she can use that to, to buy her visa, but you can't, you can't obviate your, your, um, the law that, that requires paying a minimum wage by trading it for something that's not cash. Yeah. It's in the back there. Sorry. Does what? Does the minimum wage law account for employees overseas? No, you'd have to comply with whatever the, the laws are in that jurisdiction. So if you haven't incorporated your company yet and you have contractors working with you, I'd recommend that you incorporate a company to, because otherwise they're working for you as personally. I'm sorry. There, I don't think there's a good answer to that because whatever they're doing is belonging to them unless, uh, because you have no entity to, for it to belong to. <laughs> or, you know, it'd be like a partnership. You can have, yeah. You know. One last question, anybody? Right here, yes. Uh, when you're dealing with international issues, such as international investors or having to set up operating units within other countries, uh, what can we, uh, with this global environment that we're in, this is getting more and more common to do very, very early. And so the question is, um, how do we deal with that as a U.S. corporation and maybe having to have an operating corporation in another country that have a lot of the other country? So, I mean, the, it's, it's complicated. So you, you basically have to get advice of lawyers who know the operating laws of that country or can put you in touch with, with local um, lawyers who can help you with establishing the, the company and making sure that it's appropriately set up. Okay. Great. Thank you. Donna. So thanks again, Donna. Um, lots of lots of Q and A.